So I'm going to be starting off a new series where we're going to be talking about chest tubes. And in order to start this, we really need to start with some fundamentals in order to understand the physiology of why they're needed and how they work. In this first lesson, we're going to be covering the mechanics of breathing. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. As always, the notes for this lesson as well as all the previous videos are available exclusively to the YouTube and Patreon members. You can find links to join both of those down in the lesson description below. Also, don't forget to head over to icuadvantage.com or follow that link down in the lesson description to take a quiz on this lesson, test your knowledge while also being entered into a weekly gift card. As well as don't forget that you can help support this channel through the purchase of an ICU Advantage sticker. Uh, again, those are found at the website icuadvantage.com forward slash support link down in the description. In order to best understand about our chest tubes, it helps to have a good understanding of some fundamental concepts such as how our patient's breathing actually works. And really at its most basic, breathing is the process of moving air into and out of the lungs. So when air moves in, this is going to be our inspiration, and then when air moves out, this is going to be our expiration. Alright, so to start off, we need to review over some anatomy and physiology. And we're going to start off here by talking about the lungs. So here we have our patient and their chest or their thorax, and this is where the lungs are located. Now we have our patient's airway, which comes down the trachea, and then which branches into our left and right main bronchus, which continues to further divide into bronchi, bronchioles, and ultimately into our alveolar sacs and alveoli. Now these alveoli and connective tissue are what make up the majority of what we consider our lung tissue. Now if you do want to learn more about this, I am going to link to a lesson up above where I go over the respiratory system more in depth but this connective tissue in the lungs is what helps it to keep its shape. And there is a natural elastic pressure of this connective tissue. So if the lung expands, this elastic recoil wants to pull the lung tissue back in. Now here surrounding our lungs, we have a special serous membrane that helps to protect the lung, and this is called our visceral pleura. Now in addition to that, we also have a layer of this membrane that also lines the thoracic cavity. This one's called the parietal pleura. Now, they are both technically the same pleura that is folded back onto itself, but we identify them as two separate membranes. Now, in between these pleural membranes, we do have something that we call the pleural cavity or the pleural space. Now, normally these pleural membranes are resting right up against each other with only a small amount of serous fluid separating them. Now, this fluid is actually a special lubricating fluid called the pleural fluid, and it's this fluid that actually allows the two membranes to move smoothly up against one another. Now, in the drawing here, I've over-exaggerated this pleural space. In reality, this space doesn't exist as these two layers of the membrane are going to be right up against one another, and we actually refer to this space as a potential space. Now, this will be a more important concept in some future lessons here. All right, so we talked about the anatomy of the lung. Now let's actually talk about the anatomy of the thoracic cavity. So again, here we have the patient with their lungs, and at the base of the lungs, they're actually resting a large muscle called the diaphragm. As you know, when we breathe, the diaphragm contracts. This contraction causes the diaphragm to move down, which expands the area of the thoracic cavity. Again, this will be important in just a minute here. Now, surrounding the lungs, we have our ribs, which do help to protect them. Now, in between the ribs, we have these intercostal muscles. Now, when we breathe, we also contract these intercostal muscles, which pull the ribs together and help to expand the chest wall up and outwards, again, expanding that thoracic cavity. Now, the ribs also have their own elastic pressure that, again, when expanded, want to bring the ribs back in. And then, in addition to the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles, we do have other accessory muscles that we use to breathe when we're either exercising or in respiratory distress, and I will cover these in a little bit here. All right, so now before I go into more about how breathing works, I do want to talk about some important concepts when it comes to gases, and that's really going to be our gas laws. 
and I'm not really going to get too technical with this here, but some basic concepts are necessary for you guys to understand. So first of all, we know that gases or air will want to level out their pressures. And this means that air will move from an area of high concentration or higher pressure to lower concentration or lower pressure, and this is going to be down its pressure gradient. Now, next, you also need to understand the relationship between pressure and volume. So if we have the same amount of air, but it's actually in a smaller volume, then our pressure is going to be higher. The inverse of this is also true. So if the same amount of air is in a larger volume, then we're going to have a lower pressure. And then lastly, temperature also impacts pressure. So higher temperatures lead to higher pressures and lower temperatures lead to lower pressures. To really help remember this, you can kind of think of the air in your tires. When it's winter and it's cold outside, then you actually have to add air to your tires because the pressure is low. All right, so now that we have our anatomy and our basic understanding of gas laws out of the way, let's actually talk about how our breathing works. And to start off, let's talk about the different pressures that we see. So once again, here we have our patient with their thorax, and we're going to start off talking about the pressure of atmospheric air, which is outside the body, and this is going to be about 760 millimeters of mercury. Now this does actually change based on altitude, temperature, and other factors, but we're going to say about 760. Now next we have something called our intrapulmonary pressure. And this is essentially the pressure that's in the lung. At rest, this pressure is actually the same as our atmospheric pressure, so about 760 millimeters of mercury. So this actually brings up something that I want to talk about, which is a concept that we call relative pressure. So when we compare the intrapulmonary pressure of the lung at rest and the atmospheric pressure, they're the same, and this is what we refer to as having a relative pressure of zero. So there's no difference between these two pressures here. Now the next pressure to understand is something that we call the intrapleural pressure. And this is the pressure of that pleural space that we talked about. Now this pressure here is about 756 millimeters of mercury. And so because we know that this is less, this gives us a relative pressure to the intrapulmonary pressure at rest as well as the atmospheric pressure of about negative four. So again, remember because of the gas laws that air wants to move from higher pressure to lower pressure. Thus having this negative pressure here is actually what keeps the lungs expanded out against the chest wall. And again, this will be important in future lessons here. So now on inspiration, we have the diaphragm contract, moving down, and then the intercostal muscles contracting, pulling the ribs outward. Together, these are going to be expanding that thoracic cavity. Since we now have the increased volume of this thoracic cavity, because of our gas laws, we know that this is going to decrease the pressure in the lungs, or this intrapulmonary pressure. So now the intrapulmonary pressure is about 759 millimeters of mercury, giving us a relative pressure of negative one. As a result, this higher pressure in the atmosphere will then move the air into the airway, bronchi, bronchioles, and alveoli to be used for gas exchange. Now, as I did mention though, when we are exercising or we have respiratory distress, there are additional muscles that are also used for inspiration. And for this, there's a bunch of different muscles, but we primarily have the sternocleidoid mastoid muscles, the scalene muscles, and the pectoralis muscles. And these muscles, when they're used together, they also help to expand that chest wall. Now, when it comes to expiration, that this is actually typically a passive process. So the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles are relaxed, and then the natural elastic recoil of the ribs and the lung tissue will help to pull the chest wall and lung inward. In turn, because of those gas laws, we're going to see an increase in our intrapulmonary pressure as the volume is decreased. So this is going to increase to 761 millimeters of mercury, or a relative pressure of positive one. As a result, this higher pressure in the lungs will move back out into the atmosphere, giving us our expiration. Now we can also actively assist expiration, and this is something that also occurs again with exercise or respiratory distress. And the muscles involved here are various muscles of the abdominal muscles. These muscles here contract, helping to collapse the thoracic cavity. Now, one last important caveat of all of this is that what I just talked about was actually for the spontaneously breathing patient. The process of inspiration and expiration for our mechanically ventilated patient is a little bit different. 
So there, we're actually increasing the pressure of atmospheric pressure through the ventilator. This higher pressure, aka positive pressure, then overcomes the lower pressure in the lungs, as well as overcoming those elastic forces of the lung tissue and the chest wall, and this causes air to move into the lungs and expand the lungs and chest wall. All right, and so that was our review of the mechanics of breathing. I really hope this helps you guys to kind of understand the basics of how it is that our patient breathes and some of the factors and things that are going on in there that influence the movement of air into and out of the lungs. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that. As well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.